or I'll stab you. Luckily for Kristen, this wasn't a complete shit show, though. While she did take the stranger up on his offer, she did emerge the next morning unscathed. It did, however, leave a huge concern for both family and, and investigators that maybe she did the same thing this time and wasn't as fortunate. Bradley decided to head over and talk to the apparently last Good Samaritan, and he checked out as not being involved with Kristen any further than that night previously mentioned. So with that lead crossed off, they decided to turn to the co-worker's account of what Kristen did. They had already spoken to the roommates, so that left them with the beach lead and the mysterious blonde woman. They really didn't have jack shit to go on in terms of this woman other than that she was blonde and no one knew her, and no one could confirm seeing her leave with this woman either. Although the manager was fairly certain they saw her leave alone. They kept it in mind, though, as they moved on to the beach lead. Kristen was known to take public transportation everywhere, whenever she could. The co-worker even said she had asked for bus directions to get to that beach that day. So police decided to bring in bloodhounds to track Kristen's scent. I love me a good bloodhound. They're such good puppers. I wish I owned one. Honestly, I legit get so excited when I hear they're brought into cases. It's kind of... The same when I hear psychics are brought into, even though I know they can be full of shit most of the time, I still love the allure that they bring. I wish one day that one just actually blows shit out of the fucking water and solves a million cases. But anyway, so the bloodhounds are brought in, and they track Kristen's scent to the Muni 38 Geary bus just outside the Galleria Mall. Or bus stop, I should say. There, the scent disappears, indicating that she must have gotten on the bus. So they head down to the end of the bus route that dead ends at Sutro Heights Park, which is, again, close in proximity to the beach in which she had asked directions for. This bus ride is a straight shot down Geary Boulevard, about seven miles long and west of the mall, and it's roughly a 45-minute ride. It's also just south of the land's end, and it's just a two-minute walk from that, like I said. So the bloodhounds pick her scent up again here at Sutro Beach, where it essentially disappeared at a rocky cliff landing, hot for tourists. Given that her scent was found here, investigators felt it's safe to assume that she had at least made it to the beach. They, however, grew concerned that it ended essentially at a cliff. The area is known for turbulent waves and winds and isn't exactly super safe. The waves have been known to knock people on their ass or off the cliff and into the water and they were concerned that this may have been a possibility. However, upon further investigating, they felt that given how crowded and touristy the place was, it would be extremely unlikely that Kristen could have fell or even jumped for that matter without anyone even noticing. Keep in mind, her timeline would have put her here at roughly 4 or 5 p.m.-ish, when there's still plenty of sunlight and people bustling around. With the scent dying here, it made it difficult to continue further in following this lead. They then considered the possibility of her being abducted, which is a valid theory. They felt that it was unlikely by force, considering, again, how public the area was, which left them again with the conclusion that she must have gone willingly with whomever she encountered that fateful day. What made this case even harder for police, though, was the fact that Kristen had only been living in the Bay Area for three weeks. She didn't have any roots to follow here that could have led to a deeper investigation. They had no crime scene, no phys physical evidence, no body. They had a missing person, and that was literally it. That's a rough one to try and work, even for the most seasoned detective. Now, Bob and Deb were also at a loss at this point. Not only were they completely baffled at the fact that their daughter just up and disappeared, but they were frustrated at the slow start that her case had received from the police. They felt that vital time had been lost because of this. Worried that this was going to go cold and they'd never receive any answers that they deserved, they decided to take further matters into their own hands. They refused to let Kristen's face fade from the public and wanted to get her story out there to the masses to further increase tips and leads to finding her. They initially offered a $10,000 reward for any information that could lead to solving of Kristen's disappearance. This, in turn, led to calls starting to come in. Police received an anonymous tip stating that Kristen would show up at a local diner on a specific date and time. 
They headed to that diner and staked it out for six hours before calling it and chalking it up to a prank. Which, I don't understand why there are fucking morons out there that get a kick out of calling in fake leads to missing persons or even homicide cases. Like, get a fucking life. Wasting everyone's time with your bullshit. It's stupid. They even began receiving tips from psychics <laughs> that called in saying that Kristen could possibly be on her way to Oregon. Why? I don't know. But that clearly led nowhere as well. One caller swore that they saw Kristen in Nicaragua, which also was bullshit. Eventually, all of the leads dried up once again. Bob and Deb were hoping to receive help from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, but given that Kristen had just celebrated her 18th birthday three weeks prior, they were unable to receive any help because she wasn't considered a child any longer. Bob and Deb were like, fuck, okay, what else can we do then? So they bought billboards and posted all of the case info they could on them across the entire city. Some articles even said that somebody donated billboards anonymously as well. Bob and Deb stayed in San Francisco for two weeks before they had to return home to their other children. Two days after leaving, on July 10th, the case received its biggest lead thus far. A local news channel received a call from an unidentified man claiming that Kristen had been murdered by essentially two lesbians who subsequently dumped her body over the side of a wooden bridge just outside the Point Reyes area located about 60 miles north of Crocker Galleria Mall. The man, again, didn't leave his name, but police were able to trace the call back to a guy named John Onuma, who was described at the time, get this, as a, quote, 38-year-old short Asian man with waist-length long hair who lived on O'Farrell Street, which is actually a mere seven blocks from Spinelli's. I Google mapped this street, and it is literally one street over from the main street that the bus route Kristen took that day. Very eerie. So the police head over to have a little chat with Onuma. He initially denies having any idea what the fuck they are talking about and has no idea how the call could be traced back to him. It isn't until further pressure for the truth that he admits to making the call, but that it wasn't what they thought. He placed the call, allegedly, to incriminate the two women he mentioned after him and his girlfriend at the time, Jill Lampo, felt that the two women had conspired to have Jill fired from her job at the local YMCA. Remember that? Police listened to him and just felt something was off with the guy. They were not buying what he was selling. Bradley stated that, quote, he gave us too many details. When people do that, we know they're not giving a tip. They're telling us a story. So they decided to dig a little further into Anuma's past. They found that Onuma was notorious for placing personal ads in the classifieds that attracted women, what they said, I don't know, at which point he would ambush them for money or coerce them into sex, where he'd abuse or torture them. Several women claimed to have had this happen to them, and as time went on, and it was made public that he was a person of interest, more women who were previously scared of speaking out came forward with similar situations having happened to them. Some claimed that Jill played a part in coercing women into Onuma's trap. Ex-girlfriends came forward with claims of animal abuse from Onuma after breakups. Onuma claimed that, again, they were just calls placed out of anger and revenge to implicate the two women that had essentially fired Jill. Upon searching Onuma's home, they found traces of blood that they collected. They sent it out for testing, and the results came back as blood from a cat. This led investigators to the conclusion that Onuma's ex-girlfriend's claims of animal abuse had been justified. Over at Jill's house, they seized a personal diary. When they flipped through this very detailed journal, they found that pages dated for the time period that Kristen went missing had been seemingly ripped out of the journal and were missing. When asked about this, Jill said John ripped the pages out because he was worried that the information on them would implicate him. It wasn't clarified if that meant implicated in Kristen's disappearance or other allegations, but either way, they were bad enough that they destroyed those pages specifically, and I find it more than coincidental that it was during the time that Kristen went missing. Now, despite all the suspiciousness surrounding John, and even Jill for that matter, and the potential circumstantial evidence collected, police were not able to arrest or charge John or Jill 
and have never been able to confirm their involvement in Kristen's disappearance. Sean subsequently moved away after these events of the investigation. However, it wasn't the last of his involvement in this case. In the spring of 1998, three more women came forward claiming that Sean had sexually assaulted and tortured them. One went so far as to say that John told them during an altercation that, quote, the same thing that happened to Kristen Madaffrey could happen to you. Police were throttled by this revelation and decided to track down Onuma once again, only they didn't really have a clue where he had gone. Enter America's Most Wanted. They aired a segment featuring Kristen's case and Onuma's relation to it, stating he was wanted for questioning the case. More than 70 people called in with leads as to where he was, one of which ended up leading them to John, where he had been living in his home state of Hawaii. Police felt that despite living hundreds of miles away, Onuma had visited the Bay Area fairly recently for unknown reasons. Onuma called in to the police and spoke to them for over an hour, fervently denying any involvement in the case, and that he was willing to come back in and take a lie detector test for them. Oddly enough, though, despite this, he has never been cleared as a suspect and remains a person of interest in this case. Now, three months into the case, investigators and Deb and Bob were still where they had started and received no further leeway into answers. The fall semester at NCSU had begun without Kristen. This heavily impacted her fellow classmates and Park scholars alike. Determined to keep her case in the forefront, they began producing yellow ribbons and decorated the entire school campus with them, and soon all of Charlotte was decorated in a sea of yellow as well. January of 1998, ESPN was televising the university's basketball game nationally, so the Park Scholars decided to launch the campaign of yellow ribbons then as well. They handed out yellow ribbons to every attendee, and while the NCAA prohibited the players from wearing one, Both coaches for the performing teams sported the ribbons that day. The newscasters covering the game also briefly spoke about her case and the reason behind the ribbons. This, along with both Bob and Deb's persistence, fed Kristen's case to the entire nation slowly but surely. They even went on The Maury Show, which, oh my god, I loved The Maury Show, as a way to keep their daughter's case out there and announced that they had raised the reward money to $50,000. As much as they had hoped she was still alive, they felt that she was gone by this point. In May of 1998, police had admitted that the case had hit a wall. They were positive that she was a victim of foul play and that it was possible that more than one person was potentially involved in the case, and they would urged the public to come forward with any information. They also decided to start at the beginning of the case and go over everything they had collected, but with a fine-tooth comb this time in hopes of finding anything they could have potentially missed the first time. And they found something, believe it or not. They went over the evidence they had collected from Kristen's room and discovered a piece of paper that had been collected from her trash bin. Upon examining the piece of paper, they found it to be a personal ad from one of the local papers with one particular ad circled. The ad read, Female seeking friend or friends to share activities who enjoy music, photography, working out, walks, coffee, or simply exploring the Bay Area. Interested? Call me. Now, when I read this, I felt like this sounded like an ad that Kristen had personally posted. However, while also speculated by police, they were never able to confirm who the author was. It would be kind of weird, in my opinion, to circle your own ad in a newspaper, but not impossible for someone else to do. Police went down to The Guardian, who was the newspaper that ran the article, and found out that for that week of June 11th, The Guardian ran a special promotion where you could place an ad for free, which feeds the idea that this was Kristen's ad. However, The Guardian at the time had no past records to confirm. The database they had used at the time didn't store things for an extensive amount of time, and they had since replaced their machinery, I guess, that stores the information. My question is, though, If the ad states, call me, can't you just run the phone number and confirm who posted it? There had to have been a number listed, right? I feel like that was an easy solution to the problem of who wrote the ad. No one's going to put someone else's number if they are serious about responses. This piece of evidence did have police wondering, though, if the mysterious blonde woman at Crocker Galleria that day with Kristen was either the writer or a responder to the ad. Regardless, the ad was unable to generate new leads for investigators at that time. 
Bob and Deb remained focused on not letting the case die. They hired a total of four private investigators to work the case, 